after the acid war. Rising from the dust and ashes of a Europe still reeling from the effects of the great acid war comes Colin Charteris, a futuristic Don Quixote riding the mechanized brontosaurus of the times. Charteris tries desperately to make sense of the drugged, chaotic world he lives in and finds himself hailed as the new messiah. Stranger still, Charteris himself comes to believe this. His adventures as he tries to save the world from its insanity are brilliantly told. A satiric science fiction comment on the future of mankind. The setting for this extraordinary achievement is a Europe which has been through a war fought with psychedelic agents. Its characters are madmen bombed, both literally and in the slang sense, back into the Stone Age, according to James Blish. So, it's been a while since I've mentioned Marvel Thompson. He's something of a town character here in Stone's Way, not exactly well-liked, although he is well-known. He cruises around town in his old Buick, which he seems to have souped up. He calls this Buick Beauty. When asked how his car can accelerate so quickly or take such sharp turns, his eyes sparkle. Beauty keeps her secrets, he says. Marvel has recently returned from a trip, or so he says, although he hadn't planned a vacation. It seems he was out on 158th in the middle of the night. 158th is a country road connecting County 16 and County 81. It's a paved road, unlike any of the other linking roads between the two county highways, at least near to town, and a long time ago it was popular for drag racing. This is where Marvel comes in. He's upwards of 70, maybe higher, although he seems ageless. He knows that road very well from times gone by, and he'll go out there at night sometimes, still looking for someone to race. Or, apparently, he'll just take the road himself, to test himself, even in the middle of winter, like now, when there are ice patches, or worse, ice chunks dropped by farm trucks. And so it was that he was racing along that road alone a week or so ago. How fast were you going? We ask. He smiles. 100? His eyebrows rise. 120? He smirks. More? He chuckles. He was fair unto flying, he says, taking the hops and drops of the road like a hovercraft because he was in the air so much of the time, when to his utter astonishment, he was passed on his right by someone who must have been half in the ditch, and they were by him like greased lightning. Now, Marvel is no stranger to the competitive spirit, so before the taillights of that car were too far away, he found the button to Beauty's super secret, and he blasted off. He came up hard on the lights ahead of him, except now he could see they weren't taillights at all, but a line of lights on the back of the car, or a ring of lights, as if the back end of the car was circular. As he got closer, they started scintillating. Not just red, he says. They were glowing and winking, circulating round and round the back and front curves of the car ahead of him, which he realized must be circular all the way around, like a saucer, about the diameter of a Cadillac. It was about that time, as he was staring into those lights, that he realized he couldn't feel the road beneath his car anymore. The lights were right in front of him, not ten feet ahead, but then they were somehow coming over the hood of his car, through his windshield, and into his head. Did you crash? we ask, but he shakes his head. He says he was up in the air and going higher, going faster. Then, suddenly, his car was pulled forward so hard it was like being sucked into a ray of light. And then he wasn't in his car anymore, and maybe not even in his body. Marvel pauses for a long time as if at a loss for words. He says he'll tell us plainly what happened and he doesn't care what we think, but still he says nothing. Finally, he comes out with it. He went on a trip with a UFO. He doesn't think they even knew he was there, at least at first, but then time didn't mean much of anything either. It was like he had gotten stuck to the back of their whatever it was, and then he got sucked up in their wake as they took off. He can't really tell us all that happened then. He lived his life over and over, he says, at first like a flower, with only the sun to take care of him all too briefly. But then he thinks the aliens realized they had a stowaway because he remembers being seen, being witnessed, 
being cooed over and cared for. When he lived again then, he lived until he was beyond ancient, like a tortoise, and he contemplated his own life until finally he realized it was like a bit of stained glass, his memory, but his life itself was like the light colored by the glass. After that, he lived as much as he wanted, as much as he could, and up and up he grew like Jack's beanstalk. He says he was both the beanstalk and Jack, and after that, he was the giant, too, and the gosh darn golden egg. His eyes sparkle when he says this, but not like they usually sparkle with a light of humor and possibly some malice. No, they're sparkling now because his eyes are wet and he's crying. He smiles all around at us, and I realize I've never noticed before how nice his smile is. So, what happens next is anyone's guess. Marvel made t-shirts for us all. The regular crowd at Sales, our local diner. Each with a golden egg on the front, and each unique. Because he painted them himself, as he thought about each of us and how much we mean to him. I'm a golden egg, and I want you to know you are too. You are all golden eggs. He wants to start a golden egg society but we're not quite sure what that might entail. Like, would we have to give up eating omelets?